and Rose for your presentation, taking time today to spend with us and share all of this great information. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started, and we've received a lot of questions today. So our first question is for Ramesh. Is there, what advice do you have if none of the guidances provide a category for post-approval CMC changes that a company wants to make? So uh, that's a very good question. Uh, usually it's a case by case. The company, if there are no guidances available, the company can ask for a meeting to the, with the company, uh, with, with the agency, and uh, say a type C meeting usually, and uh, they put their uh, package together and ask specific questions uh, what uh, exactly the meeting package should contain the exact plan and uh, what kind of a change they are going to make and how it is going to be implemented and then what kind of data the agency expects from you know from them so they can put the put in the form of a questions and then we can respond to them either by written responses only or give them an audience with a TCON or face to face meeting. Uh, these are done and this can they can get clarification. And uh, if some of the things that uh, uh, which do not have a proper answer we, we will because if, if they are precedent setting, we have to really think about it and then respond to them appropriately. So that's why a meeting package is recommended for these kinds of situations. Great, thank you so much. And another question for you. How should a sponsor assess a change pre-approval setting? For example, a formulation change between phase two and phase three. Okay. So this is the pre-approval thing, right? Uh, so when, uh, when, when, when you have changing formulation uh, during the uh, clinical trials, uh, you need to uh, involve uh, the uh, biopharmaceutical for biopharmaceutics folks as well as clinical pharmacology the formulation change can have a serious impact on bioavailability uh, or even the quality in the case of uh, if you're using biopharmaceutics the dilution parameters as quality uh, parameters so you we need to get the clinical pharmacology folks involved in these kinds of situations and when you make a change uh, in formulation, especially during a clinical trial, you want to keep the agency informed and let them know what changes you are specifically making and what kind of uh, bioavailability requirements are necessary at that time. You might want to really contact the agency the same way, uh, put a meeting package together and ask for an audience and then see how to proceed ahead with the, uh, with the trials accordingly because that may have an impact on the clinical uh, study protocol as well uh, because it, it, the original protocol approved may be, might have been different uh, for one formulation for the other formulation. So these are things that need to be considered and it's better to contact the agency at that time. Great, thank you. So that, so that, yeah, that's very helpful. All right, we have another question for you, and the question is, what post-approval changes can trigger submitting a comparability protocol prior to submitting a supplement? Well, what, can I repeat the question? Or Okay, the question is, what post-approval changes can trigger submitting the submission of a comparability protocol prior to submitting a supplement? So the comparability protocol can be submitted in both two ways. One, within the NDA, you can say you can plan, this is what I, I'm going to change the manufacturing facility, for example. That's one example of a comparability protocol. Okay, you can submit it within the NDA, and if you, the NDA is approved, uh, the comparability pro protocol is automatically approved. Then the results of the comparability protocol can be submitted as a CB30 or a CB0, depending upon what kind of agreement you make at the time of submission of the comparability protocol. Or in the post-approval setting, 
you can get some business a supplement, prior approved supplement, which is a compatibility protocol. And this compatibility protocol supplement uh, can have various uh, for various changes. For example, I think you uh, you saw Hasbuk's uh, talk where he said manufacturing facilities one uh, important example. Another example is uh, uh, say if you are making a change from one uh, type of a packaging to another type of a packaging and making sure that the quality of uh, in the new packaging doesn't change. And uh, there are several things that you can use the comparative protocol for. And uh, once the comparative, remember it's a protocol. So you plan out exactly what you're going to uh, compare, what you're going to do in the new facility or in the new setting. And then provide what kind of data you're going to generate to show that the quality of the product has not changed from the originally approved to what is going to be uh, going to be accomplished in the comparability protocol. So you have to spell that out all in the protocol. Then you have to uh, remark on what kind of a protocol data you're going to submit, CBE 30. Sometimes if it's a manufacturing facility, right? If you have a manufacturing facility, uh, that has never been inspected before. You cannot submit it. Uh, submit the results as a CP30. It might have to be a prior approval supplement. So that is one other thing. Oh. Great. Thank you so much, Ramesh. And we actually have an additional some additional information from Hasmuk. So please go ahead and um, and share and add on to to this answer. Uh, hello. Uh, this is in addition to what uh, Ramesh said about the comparability protocols. Comparability protocols are not mandatory. It is up to you uh, to facilitate implementation later on once comparability protocol is approved. So you don't, there is you no know, any change in the in CMC size or size strategy. You can submit a comparability protocol, but it is up to you. Not mandatory. Great, thank you so much. And we have another question for Ramesh, and then we'll go to Rose next. So we actually received several questions about established conditions. So could you provide major recommendations on in the inclusion of established conditions? And another question about what, what really should be specifically identified in an ANDA? Thank you. All right. Established conditions are a part of uh, ICHQ-12. So this is a very interesting thing, this evolving thing, as a, as a matter of fact. So when you, for giving you one example, uh, say, do you remember I told you that this ICHQ-12, Asmuk told you, was also I reiterated that ICHQ-12 is like a blueprint of planning of uh, the life cycle of the product, right? Now, in the, in the planning process, you know that, say, for example, you're looking ahead, that you will change something. For example, uh, you had two crystallization steps in the, say, in the drug substance uh, purification process. Now, you're going to, say, scale it down to one crystallization step or one purification step. Now, uh, you originally did it to make sure, ensure that the quality of the product. Now, over the period of time, you have found out one one purification step is adequate. So that can be an established condition. So the, the change you are anticipating to make can be an established condition. So you are going to change from one kind of a established condition to another established condition. And so if, in order to make the change, you will submit a supplement. This supplement will depend, up, will depend upon the risk factor. Usually these kinds of changes will be a prior approval supplement and uh, you can submit that to, uh, to the agency for approval. So before uh, having a uh, say, before you can make sure that this particular thing is acceptable, you might want to contact the agency with questions, say this is what you want to do and uh, this established condition. So, uh, is it acceptable to the agency or not? And then you could uh, 
you could uh, you know uh, submit it uh, accordingly. So uh, Hasmuk would like to add something to that. Maybe I will take the uh, ask Hasmuk to talk about it a little bit more. Hasmuk, go ahead, and we'd love to hear your insights. Uh, so these are the Sunday functions to assess for the quality. Now, when it comes to like the recommendations for established conditions, I, I think uh, you know you look at which elements are necessary to assure the product quality. And couple couple of examples I gave were critical process parameters or critical functions to you. Now, I, I, I think in that case you justify in your submission and that why they are necessary for the product quality. Now, a list of the information we call it supported information or, or also we call non established condition. I think it becomes more important to justify non established condition or supported information because that is what you are going to manage in your, your pharmaceutical quality system. So, we pay more attention to those conditions. A couple of uh, applications can be approved, like one. A uh, couple of conditions we approved in the original MBA, and then we approved a couple of supplements for pro in post approval for drug substance and drug code, where you know the list of uh, established and other conditions and we you know had in the application, but our focus was on supporting information on established conditions. So justify both in your submission. You are the one who know about your order, so you look at the product uh, CNC and say, okay, these are the only conditions which we think are established conditions to um, uh, assure product quality and risk is non established uh, or supposed information. Great, thank you both. And our next question is going to be for Rose. What is the difference between a CBA or CBE zero and a CBE? 30. Yeah, um, as um, I already mentioned in my slides, CBE zero means any change that is effective already when you submit it to FDA. CBE 30 means that you submit the change to FDA and after 30 days, if you did not hear anything from FDA, then this change will be effective. So that's the difference. And in my slides, I already talked about the risk. So you have to uh, make a you know decision whether to submit CVE zero or CVE thirty based on the risk. Great, thank you. Another question for you: Is the process validation required for a PAS or a CVE thirty? Well, really, it depends on what change, right? If the change is. Um, you know, is the risk is higher, you really need to finish the processing validation. So this is a very broad question. I cannot really say yes or no. Depend really have to depend on the change. Okay, thank you. So another question. If a manufacturing facility SOP has changed, for example, camping rejection or tolerance change and only the SOP number reference to the batch record. Do they need to notify the agency through AR? Yeah, some do because depend on whether this will impact the um, you know the process. So you can report this in the annual report. Um, otherwise, when we come for the inspection, we actually will review all those uh, change. Like if, for example, so like SOP number change, then um, you don't need to. But when we come for inspection, we will look at all these things. Okay, great. And our next question is for Rose. Would a transfer of drug substance manufacturing site to a brand new building, but it's the same company that's across the street, and it's been satisfactorily inspected by the FDA, does that need a PAS or a CBE-30? Um, so my first answer is CBE-30. But there are some conditions that even though you have to move the you know drug substance or you add in the alternative side, but it's the same street. So it's under the same FEI number, which means you're under the same quality team. 
and that facility has acceptable inspection history, and there's absolutely no change on manufacturing of this drug substance, then you can submit a CBE survey. Great, thank you. What is the type of change when a sterilizer is changed to its successor model and what data is necessary? Well, first, uh, you have to provide the, uh, the qualification of this new equipment, right? And then you have to, come, you have to uh, finish the, um, uh, I think you said a new model. So equipment qualification and uh, you also need to, uh, that also including IQ, IQ, OQ, PQ, right? The PQ really means you put the real product there and then doing one run and compare with the current one and see what the equivalent between these two. Okay, great. And another question for Rose. What is the reporting category for an addition of a new testing site for excipients? You actually can report this either in annual report or in CDE zero because we think it is sponsor's responsibility, not a sponsor, manufacturer's, which I mean drug product or drug substance manufacturer's responsibility to control the quality of the excipients. Okay, great. And one more question for you, Rose, and then we'll go back to Ramesh and Hasmu. Sure. For a sterile drug product, what is the reporting category for an addition of, of alternate processing line that was already approved for similar drug products and container closure system? If this site has a acceptable compliance history and this uh, same feeding line has approved CDE survey. Okay, great, thanks. And this next question is for Ramesh. For changes on active ingredients impacting several pharmaceutical products, prescription and OTC, can we submit only one application for all products at the same time? So it, it depends. Uh, so if it is the same change for, uh, for one particular change for several applications, and it's the same discovered. For example, you had uh, several applications you have, several drug products, and you are changing the testing facility for all those products to say one uh, place to another. The same change, right, is applicable to all. You can bundle all of them as one application and list all these applications as a change and do it as a PAS or CBE 30, depending upon the risk of the change. Yes. Uh, but then if the, the change is different, you cannot. And if the data is different, you cannot. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And another question for Ramesh. How long does it take for FDA to approve a comparability protocol supplement? Uh, the comparability protocol is a prior approval supplement, which is four months, the four-month clock. Um, so the Four-month block is, uh, is, the, is the, the results of the comparability protocol will be like uh, CBE 30, it's a six-month block. Okay, great. And we have another question about slide 31, I believe, on Hasmuk's presentation. It's the last bullet point, and they say, an identical change, for example, on an active ingredient impacting several products does the comparability protocol on only one of the products representing the worst case have to be submitted, or do they have to sub or do they have to develop comparability protocols for each product? Uh, in this case, uh, you have multiple applications where you use active ingredients. Can actually use uh, ingredients for multiple applications. So comparability protocol, we can submit, we have to submit for each application. We can group, normally as I mentioned in the earlier answer, that we group those supplements. Now for the active ingredient part, the protocol will be the same, right? Because you know what you will do to make sure that uh, so, uh, active ingredient after the change will be the same or later. So that part will remain same. Now, for the specific 
information may change. So you may have to do additional testing for some products or just test the product as per specifications to show that the change in uh, the substance active ingredient will uh, impact product quality. So if you look at comparability, even though it is the same change for all the methods, um, uh, each application should have a, its own comparability protocol. Now, for example, in this case, uh, it is different like active ingredients. So, uh, you have to consider its impact on the product quality, but let's say for packaging, you change just the acidity, acidity bottle or closer for solid or process form, then probably you may not need uh, product specific information in the comparability protocol. It may be the same for all products. <laughs> Okay, th thank you. Oh, are you, Hasbuk, if you could um, maybe move a little closer to your computer. Um, I think we're having, the, our transcribers having a little bit of a hard time being able to transcribe what you're saying. So if you can come a little bit closer, we really want to hear what you have to say, um, maybe to com your computer. Um, but with that, actually, I think we'll just go, it's a little bit muffled, so um, I think maybe we'll, we might move on to our next question, if that's all right. So we're going to go to Ramesh for uh, a question. Could you explain how type A, B, and C meetings differ? The type A meeting is uh, based on the emergency and based on the need and the uh, uh, so for example, type A meeting, that we have to respond within 30 days. There are conditions about type A meeting where uh, if you request a type A meeting, you have to submit the meeting package uh, and the questions before requesting it. And it, when it's granted type A meeting, we have to respond to you within 30 days. Whereas in the case of type B and C meeting, uh, that B meeting, uh, is a kind of meeting where you'll have uh, for 60 days, uh, and uh, we will we have to grant the meeting within 60 days. And the Type C meeting uh, is a low priority. It depends upon the priority. The Type A is the top, top high priority. Uh, if it's something, say, uh, a meeting which you will require because it's, uh, your particular drug is going to be in a shortage, you want to request a meeting. You want you might want to if it's going to cause a public health impact then you provide a type A meeting. If it's a type B meeting, it is a moderate impact. And the type C meeting is a low impact. So the, that is the timeline is different. And then the time with which we uh, give back the, uh, give you the feedback. And, uh, uh, so everything has to be followed accordingly. Yeah. So you can look up uh, in the web, FDA website about the type A, B, C meeting. Uh, it is very clearly uh, answered there. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ramesh. And again, for Ramesh, as most guidances describe a, the type of manufacturing change, could you talk about some of the guidances specifying the documents needed for a defined CMC change? Uh, can you please repeat that question again? Please. Sure. So many of the FDA guidances describe a type of manufacturing change are there guidances or guidelines specifying the documents needed for a for a CMC change? So, uh, okay. Remember, when you you are manufacturing the product and you know the product very well, so whatever change, if it is not in the in the guidances, it doesn't mean guidances only a. a pathway, right? But it doesn't cover everything uh, in the world, basically. So you, you have to understand that. So the for your product, for your change, it may be different. That's why there is no fixed, uh, uh, you know, way of doing things. And we assess the risk based on a case-by-case -case basis. So you can... Uh, 
submit your questions to the agency the same way and be, there's a no proper guidance that uh, that represents what you wish to do for your product, then we, the agency will come back to you and respond to you accordingly. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ramesh. And we actually have Hasmuk, who's going to be adding on to the previous question, a little bit more data. Regarding meetings, type A, type B, and type C, there is a guidance available on FDA website where you can get uh, detailed information. And uh, as Ramesh said, type A is for the uh, you know, development part of the drug where something went wrong or you know, it, uh, clinical hold also where you want to discuss immediately. And type C is not high prior to where you know, it takes uh, like about 60 to, 60 to 75 days for us to respond. But the point is here, yeah, there is a guidance for you to look at on a period site. Great, thank you so much, that's very helpful. Okay, our next question is for Hasmoot or, or Ramesh. Why is the change in the composition of the immediate release tablet drug product? Is that just a SUPAC IR, or is that a change to the approved NDA or ANDA? Uh, the, the immediate release uh, and the extended release have two different uh, guidances. Uh, so the immediate release, you know, is not, not necessarily, it, it, the dissolution is expected to be standard, right? Well, in the case of the extended release, it varies from formulation to formulation and how the drug becomes bioavailable. A lot more intricate. That's why there's a difference between the immediate release and the uh, extended release. So that's why there are two different guidances. Great. Thank you so much. And our next question is for Rose. What is the FDA recommended filing category for a change in the shape of a solid oral dosage form or tablet? So if this is the immediate release, this is really depend. If it's immediate release and we think the risk is low, you can report this in CVE 30 or CVE 0. However, if this is the, um, as I mentioned in my slides, if this is the um, controlled release tablet, that change of the shape, might change the um, release, uh, you know, the speed, right? Therefore, you may need to submit a PAS. So the answer is depends. Um, I have to uh, give the example. Sorry, that's the sound. Uh, that is talking about the laser drill tablet. Maybe change of that shape will change the release speed. Therefore, the risk is high. In this case, a PAS should be submitted. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rose. And we actually have one more question for you, which will be our last question of the day uh, for this session. So is the warehouse or storage considered part of the manufacturing site? What if it is an off-site storage facility or a distributor? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Is the warehouse or storage considered part of a manufacturing site. So what if they have an off-site storage facility or distributor? Does that count as part of the manufacturing site? Um, it is part of the manufacturing site. However, if they change this, they can report this in the CVE 0 because we think that um, the um, risk is low. But that is under the condition that this storage site um, has already been inspected by FDA. Because storage, certain, certain storage sites need certain conditions, right? So we do need to inspect and make sure that um, the facility is in compliance. Okay, great. Thank you, Rose, Ramesh, and Hasmuk for all your fantastic 
um, preparation and making all these great presentations and for taking time to answer the questions. And with that, I'm going to turn